Hello everyone, it is uh, April 10th, 2019. This is the quarterly scouting report. My name is Adam Koch. I am president and portfolio manager at Libertas Wealth Management Group in Columbus, Ohio. And um, I hope everyone's starting to enjoy some of the warmer weather here in the Midwest. And um, I guess I've got a lot to go over today. Um, I always start these uh, screencasts every quarter with the intention of making them relatively short with only a few charts and then as I start to dive in I get all excited and the next thing you know I've got way too much going on so rather than uh, go through housekeeping let's just talk about our agenda real quick and talk about what we're gonna discuss today so first we'll talk about a little recap of 2018 again um, with some new data that I found um, as well as some history we'll look at a seasonal look at this year so 2019 which is a pre-election year I'm not sure if you can believe that already but uh, we are already right, uh, what, 18 months or so away from the next presidential election, believe it or not. Uh, we'll go over some stocks, we'll talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, there's really not all that much ugly, but definitely a lot to be concerned about. So I'll share a little bit about what I like, what I don't like, and then we'll move on to uh, interest rates and bonds. Um, we'll talk a little bit about alternative investments like oil and gold, which kind of reminds me that uh, we'll talk about some of my favorite things, which I'll add. Um, and then uh, not one of my favorite things, but uh, Bitcoin is still in the news. So we'll talk just uh, briefly about that. So moving forward, let's talk a little bit about the stock market. So start uh, with a little bit of history. So last year, um, if you look at this is Jack Hirsch uh, at Stock Traders Almanac. He does some great work. And um, I've been a subscriber of theirs for a long, long time now. But um, what I want you to focus on is a couple things here. So first of all, the black line is the average movement of the stock market, in this case the S&P 500, during a midterm election year, which was last year, 2018. So on average, we see the market pretty much go from zero to up 2% in mid-April to down about a half percent in uh, call it mid-June and then it goes pretty much nowhere till October and then in October it has a tendency to just shoot straight up uh, from being down about 1% to up around call it 6 to 7%. Last year however 2018 was quite the opposite. I don't think this, this is going to uh, look anything like the averages. In fact it'll be interesting to see what it actually does to the averages since 1950 here. But as you can see 2018 was up then it was down 10%, then up, then down 8%. Then we kind of had a steady ride here between April and September 21st, after which it went down 20%, um, 19.8% to be exact, in just over three months. So kind of a crazy, messy year, um, and definitely a tough time uh, to be invested in the stock market. Uh, in fact, last year, I believe the stat that I heard was, this is the uh, last year, 2018, was the fourth year in history that all these asset classes went down here. So uh, the U.S. stocks were down, um, bonds, this is the 20-year treasury, so bonds were actually down as much as 7 or 8%. It's only because they had a good two months to end the year that they were actually only down 4.2%. Uh, commodities were down almost 13%, and then international stocks, large and mid, uh, large and small caps, down anywhere between 16 and upwards of 17%. So again, not really anywhere to hide last year, and uh, any effort to diversify definitely hurt your account. Um, so let's look at this year. So some of those same statistics. This is a uh, pre-election year. So next year's the election year. That makes this a pre-election year. And uh, the first thing we have is kind of just the averages of the uh, NASDAQ here on top. So you can see how the Dow and the S&P 500 pretty much track right along with one another. So when we look at the, uh, let's just look at the S&P 500 because that's probably a little bit um, more realistic. But um, NASDAQ's a little bigger. It's got more stocks in it, definitely more small caps, uh, small companies. But here the S&P 500 and uh, the Dow Jones, uh, on average in pre-election years, pretty much go from zero to being up right around 11 12% by about May or June, on average. And then you kind of see this pullback in May to June, and then it kind of heads steadily higher until just before uh, the election, maybe a couple months, call it mid-September. Then we get kind of a pullback on average until the election after which the market kind of shoots up from being up around 11 12% to north of about 15 16%. So pre-election years are pretty good years for the stock market on average. Um, obviously, that hasn't really been the case this year. And um, in fact, I was just talking to a client recently. I know there's a lot of news, uh, whether it be the radio, uh, TV, financial media. Um, and some of the most recent news that uh, some of our clients have been telling us about is that they keep hearing about the 
you know, this big, healthy, uh, historic bear, uh, bull market. So remember, bull markets are good, bear markets are bad. So this historic bull market that they're looking at. Now, it all depends on your time frame. For me, you know, my time frame is a little bit longer term. I'm looking more out, call it nine to 12 months. Um, you know, with an average hold time about nine months. So I don't really care too much about, you know, two months, call it, you know, eight to 12 weeks worth of stock movement. Obviously, we're looking for warnings of tops. We're looking for opportunities to participate in the upside in markets. But the historic bull market they're talking about on the news right now, anyway, is this here from uh, the bottom here in G December, January to where we are today. That's it. And if I don't know about you, but to me, the a healthy bull market would be something like 2017, which I've outlined here. This is a nice steady uptrend with, uptrend with almost no volatility um, in 2017 compared to 2018, which is definitely to me not a healthy bull market. Um, right now, you could argue the trend might be up. I don't know, it depends on your time frame. For me, if you're a short-term trader, yeah, maybe the trend is up. Um, but for the longer term investors, um, longer term uh, financial advisory firms such as ours, that's the time frame we're looking at is intermediate term to long term. It's pretty choppy right now. And as one of my good friends, uh, JC Peretz says, um, you know, it's a pretty much a hot mess. So uh, <clears throat> a couple things about this chart. Back during the healthy bull market, we this is down in the bottom pane here. This is a momentum indicator. It's called RSI, a relative strength index. Back in 2017, we didn't have almost any crosses below 30. And when, you, when you're in a good market, you want to see momentum between 30 and 100 and really between 40 and 100, but above 30 just to make this easy here. And then we want to see a lot of crosses above 70. That's bullish. That's healthy. That's where we want to be. When the market can't get above 70 but makes trips down here below 30, and then we have... Um, not to quote, you know, the financial media and the radio and some of the things we're hearing right now, but this quote unquote historic bull market we've seen the last couple months. Um, okay, yeah, it's it's had a big sprint off the bottom, but we really aren't seeing the kind of momentum you would want to see if this were a real bull market, if it were a real healthy rally. Now that doesn't mean it can't pull back here, consolidate, and then head higher. So we could see if we see all time highs, I think we see higher momentum. But right now we're just not seeing a lot of that just yet. So that's the first thing I wanted to look at is the last couple of years and just kind of offer some perspective. Um, because what we don't want to have happen, get, get your eyes on this chart for a second, is this. You know, this is 2007, 2008, we've got kind of this Short-term downtrend goes down about 14, 15% right here. Then it bounces, it's down again, bounces. And before you know it, we start seeing lower lows and lower highs between uh, the beginning of 2008 and then into 2009 before you get a drop of about 57, 58%. But again, I want to point out here, no trips above 70 in momentum down here in the bottom. And we get plenty of trips below 30 down here. Plenty. So we, we don't see that healthy momentum here in 2007, 2008, 2009, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking at when I'm trying to determine how healthy this market is and how much it's worth taking risk. Now, I've kind of beaten up the market a little bit here and, and, and shared some concerns. Let me share a couple things I like. So one of the things I like in the near term here, this momentum indicator down here at the bottom is something called moving average convergence divergence, or, or MACD for short. One of the things I like here is that we are seeing um, lower highs, which is not good, but a breakout. So when you see lower highs in momentum, when the mark's not, market's going higher or flat in this case, that's usually not good. That's called negative momentum divergence. But just recently, in fact, just last week, we saw a breakout above this downward sloping trend line which could indicate that maybe we're starting to see momentum break out here and we're starting to see uh, uh, some in evidence that prices could head higher and the market could become healthy or a lot healthier. If we look at uh, the long term here, if we scan backward, uh, some of the things I'm looking at here is this black dotted line, which is uh, represents the January 2017 highs. And the reason I like that level, as, as far as paying attention to it anyway, is it's the level that we broke out above in 2018 in summer, and we're not able to hold before things just kind of fell apart and the bottom fell out of the market. So I'm going to keep paying attention to that line in the sand, partially because we just broke above it, literally, just recently. The other thing I like to look at here is the highs from October, November, December, and March, which we were also able to break above, obviously. Um, but the big, huge line in the sand is the ceiling of potential resistance up here at the all-time highs 
from back in September. So let's zoom in a little bit here. Um, so again, this, this black dotted line is the January 2018 high. Um, we got above that, failed, which was not good, and then the bottom fell out of the market. We're back above that now. We've got this blue line, which represents a floor of potential support at the October, November, December, and March highs. I'd like to stay above that, and I'd really like to stay above the January highs as well. But again, what we really have to contend with here is this all-time high, the ceiling over top of us, that we've got to break through before this market can ever head into a really, really healthy upward bull market. And I, again, I know I keep beating this thing to death, but you know we've got trips below 30 down here in momentum and a real struggle to get above 70. So not to say that it can't, again, I can't repeat myself more here, not to say that this can't get back above 70 after we get some more sideways movement or maybe even a pullback and then a move to higher prices. But at least for now, um, this is definitely a, a picture that I, when I look at this chart, um, the phrase that comes to mind is cautiously optimistic. Optimistic, but cautiously so. All right, next chart. Um, one of the things I want to avoid seeing in the future is what we saw in 2015-16. So this is a really messy chart, and I apologize. Um, this is actually one that we have been showing our clients a lot, um, comparing this to uh, the market today to 2015-16. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, obviously. We're not trend predictors. We are trend followers. So my point I want to look at here is here, we saw the market go down, up, down, and up. So a W pattern. See the W? If I just draw a line here. Um, we go down, up, down, up. We've got our W. So um, we did not experience a W pattern this time. This has been a V bottom so far. But the thing is, is we don't know that it can't be a W pattern, meaning we don't know that this here, this uh, breakout above the 200-day moving average, which is this ro rose-colored uh, red line here, we don't know that that can't end up being something like this where it goes up, breaks out and then heads back down again even lower than it did before. So again, it's it's really, really important, I think, to take a very cautious look to this market as opposed to just being um, ultra aggressive and just throwing all your money and putting all your money in the market and being all in all the time. Moving on again, this is a little bit to longer term. Um, some positive news and maybe something I'm not so f uh, I'm so much a fan of here is this uh, this line right here. This moving average is the 10 month moving average. Every one of these candlesticks is one month, and I want you to ignore the last one because um, it's actually the beginning of this month, which you can't count any monthly candlestick until the month is over. So obviously April's not over yet, but in um, March and in February we closed above the 10 month moving average. To make things easier, what I've done is I've shaded the times when the market's below, has closed below the 10 month moving average in red. So these vertical shaded lines are when we really wanna be defensive and we really wanna protect our portfolios. In other words, think of them like tornado sirens, but not tornado watches, tornado warnings, um, that there is a tornado in your area. So you can see here a 57.7% drop, almost 58% between 2007 and 2009, and that's exactly what we're trying to avoid here. Sometimes it ends up being a head fake, um, or uh, something I've been saying lately is it's like the, the market that cried wolf, and it ends up not happening, but I don't think you wanna ignore the tornado sirens and just stay in your living room um, and risk getting wiped out. I think it makes more sense uh, to go to the basement. So and something else to keep in mind, this is a 12-year chart, and we talked about momentum earlier. One thing I don't like on this chart, while I like that we're back above the 10 month moving average, what I don't like is that we see lower highs in momentum with higher highs in price. And what that means to me, again, negative divergence in momentum and uh, price has a tendency, not all the time, but it has a tendency to follow momentum. And obviously in this case, momentum is sloping down. So I'd like to see this trend line here, uh, this slope get broken on the upside at some point if, again, we're going to see a healthy bull market. Moving to the next one, um, this is something else that's kind of bothering me a little bit. Um, this is a financial stocks, so um, banks, uh, financial companies. It's really, really difficult to have a all-out bull market when m banks and, and financials aren't doing well. And you can see here, compared to the stock market, which if I go back here to the uh, zoomed-in version of the U.S. stock market right here, We've got this low and then we've just had higher. When you look at banks, it just hasn't been the same story. You know, we've kind of got lower lows with this seemingly inability for the market to get above this 200 day moving average, which is sloping down. 
Um, not only that, um, not that this really matters, but we have negative sloping momentum with the inability again for momentum to get above 70. And then we have trips below 30 again. Um, the second thing here is small cap stocks. The reason why small companies uh, or small caps are important is because when small caps go up, they tend to lead the market up. In other words, when we're in a good, healthy bull market, small caps tend to lead first, then mid caps, then large caps. When markets crash, small caps tend to crash first, then mid-sized companies, and then as people climb the wall of worry to quality, meaning dividend paying blue chips and large caps, um, that's usually the last thing to fall. So what I, what I liked on one hand was that off the bottom, small caps did a great job, and we actually had some positive uh, momentum here. In fact, some very decisively positive momentum. But what I don't like is we just can't seem to get above these um, uh, October highs, and uh, here's some highs in uh, April, and we're also staying below again, just like financials, below a uh, downward sloping 200 day moving average, which which again, I don't like. One other chart here um, that I always show in almost all these presentations and a lot of my market commentary that I write each week is a very, very long term momentum indicator called price momentum oscillator. Um, Carl Swenlin invented this. Um, the reason I like it is because it's so slow. And I think that the slower the indicator and the longer it takes to get a signal, the more those signals need to be respected and paid attention to. So um, this is 25 years you're looking at. Um, and all we have is one, two, three, four, five negative signals. One, two, three, four, five positive signals. Obviously, every positive signal resulted in the market going up. However, there's been whipsaws, like here, the, we got a sell signal in 1998, and it was wrong ended up being a whipsaw, we had to pay higher prices to get back in. So the tornado siren went off, but there was no tornado. Here's a sell signal, absolutely valid. Um, got us out a little bit early, maybe earlier than I would have liked to be, but either way, a good warning sign. Here um, in 19, I'm sorry, 19, uh, 2008, this got us out a little bit late, but who's complaining here? Um, if this is um, you know a big slow indicator that needs to be respected and you follow it, then I think this did a lot for you back in 2007, 2008 to avoid an enormous crash. Um, and then here we've got uh, the sell signal that occurred back in 2015. And the problem with this whipsaw right here is that it took so long, about two years of absolutely nowhere. Um, and that's really, really frustrating. And most investors don't have that kind of patience. And then of course we have the sell signal that took place in November, which um, at least so far is still valid. But one of the things I like on this chart for the market is that we're starting to see this thing curl up. So what I'm, the reason you're getting these signals up here is every time we see a negative crossover of this black line, then we're getting a sell signal. Every time we see a positive crossover, it's uh, you know a blue up arrow. That's our buy signal. So anyway, if you, uh, I just want you to see what I'm looking at. But we're seeing this thing start to curl up. So it's possible. If it curls up and heads higher and crosses above it, this is a good piece of positive evidence that all we've seen is another market crying wolf and uh, another whipsaw, but um, a very solid uh, indication that the market could be headed to new highs. However, that being said, if this thing curls up but then fails and heads back down, that's a really, really bad sign. Um, so this is something I'm paying very, very close attention to each and every month. Um, because again, the reason I say monthly is because it is a monthly indicator. We have to wait until the end of April before I can look at it and it's a valid signal. Here's a fun one um, I showed back in January. I've also showed this a couple times in my market commentary. Um, <clears throat> another one of our clients brought up unemployment. Um, one of the things I'm hearing these days is, um, oh, the economy is doing great. So since the economy is doing so well, then the market's, you know, got to be doing well. And, and there's really no reason to be cautious. There's no reason to be defensive. I can't disagree more. And here's why. Most people don't realize that the stock market is a leading indicator for the economy. I'm going to repeat that. The stock market is a leading indicator for the economy. What that means is the stock market crashes before recessions occur all the time. You don't see a recession unless the market has already started going down. So to say that the economy is doing really well and that's why I should be invested in stocks doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because this, I believe the statistic is um, or the data suggests that the stock market has a tendency to, to turn down roughly eight to nine months before a recession. So. One of the things I wanted to point out here is the unemployment rate. So in the bottom pane down here, we have going back to 1992, the unemployment rate, which bottomed out in 2000, 
And here's the stock market up here. It was a little bit early, but when the, it, when the unemployment rate bottoms, it tends to tell us, or at least give us a warning sign that the market might be fragile and it might be topping. Here's the same thing, granted a little bit higher, Unemployment rate drops to about 4.5% here. It bottoms, goes sideways for roughly, we'll call it uh, 9 to 12 months. This time it's really early, so it wasn't exactly the best, most perfect predictor, necessarily speaking. But it's um, it bottomed out, went sideways for a while, and then all of a sudden, um, just within, looks like about 12 months, the market peaked and headed down. What we have today is an unemployment rate that's bottomed just uh, late, mid to late last year. And we're starting to see some higher unemployment rates going uh, forward here. And here's where we are in the market. Now, again, I want to reiterate, we are not trend predictors. We are trend followers. We use a weight of the evidence approach to determine how we invest our clients' money. And all I'm doing here is I'm looking at a bunch of different evidence to determine how heavily invested we should be in stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies, or stocks overseas for that matter at any given time. And this is just one piece of evidence that tells me that maybe um, this is a warning signal and that we need to be paying attention to this each and every month. So um, let's switch gears and talk about bonds and interest rates. Um, as most of you probably know, um, when interest rates go down, bonds go up. This is a chart of the bond market. This is the 10 year treasury bond going, or I'm sorry, yield, I'm sorry, going down since the 80s. Um, anybody who's been around and owned a house in the 80s knows you probably paid about 14% or higher on your mortgage. Not anymore these days, obviously. Rates are a lot lower. But the, the beneficiary of this statistic is that as interest rates have gone down, we've seen a huge bull market in bonds. Bonds have done really well. But now what we're starting to see is potentially a bottoming in rates. The thing is, is that rates don't bottom like the stock market does. So this could take really, really long before we actually start to see a full-blown bottom in interest rates. But whenever rates come down, bonds go up. Whenever rates go up, bonds go down. So this has been kind of an interesting time to own bonds. And um, I think that one needs to be a little bit careful um, with when they own bonds. And I don't think that you just want to buy and hold them. I think you want to um, implement some sort of active, active tactical strategy um, to especially protect against drops in bonds, like for instance, from here in 2018 to, uh, um, I'm sorry, 2016 through 2018. But um, right now, we we're seeing a head fake above this downtrending line, and rates are coming down again. So we'll see. We don't know if this is the bottom just yet, but um, I think that there's a lot of evidence that suggests that perhaps this could be a bottoming process that's taking place here. Talk about some alternative investments. Um, I'm going to kind of transition this into some things that I do like, but let's start with something that I don't like, which is Bitcoin. I'm still in news, so let's just talk about it briefly here. Um, momentum again increasing um, pretty much since November, um, all while price Bitcoin was going pretty much sideways. Um, that would indicate that perhaps price could follow momentum, and sure enough, it did. What I think is funny about uh, Bitcoin, though, is that since the peak back in November of 2017, it went down about 90%. Now just look at this chart, 90% it went down from $38 a share on this uh, ETF, uh, the Bitcoin Trust ETF, down to uh, right around, we'll call it $3.70 or so. But it's since it bottomed here back in uh, earlier this year, it's gone up 91.2% as of uh, today's close, which is um, uh, April 10th. And I guess the reason I wanna point that out is, you tell me, and I'm obviously um, this is a screencast, you can't answer my question, but does this drop look as bad as this gain? Said another way, you lost 90% of your money if you held this thing all the way down the hill. You made 91, and you aren't even a third of your way back to even. And that brings me up to something that I usually kind of close with, and that is, um, we're not closing yet today, but um, you know I don't really mind as trend followers, there's going to be times when we lose 10% or even 15%. We don't know how long it'll take to earn that money back, but we know that mathematically, if we lose 10%, it only takes 11% to get back to even, as long as the market deals us good cards. If we lose 15% even, it only takes 18% gains to get back to even. If we're, again, if we're dealt good cards by the market. If the market doesn't give us good cards, it's gonna take longer, obviously, but when we get good cards, it doesn't take us long to get back. The problem is, if we lose 30%, 40%, 50%, it takes a whole lot more to get back to even. Like 2008, market goes down 37% uh, calendar year. It takes about 65% to get back to where we started. If you lose 50% of your money, 
It takes 100% to get back to where you started. And I've never shown this next chart before. This is from Crestmont Research. Great stuff here. Um, um, mentor of mine, uh, Greg Morris, also has put out some wonderful stuff just like this. But um, what this shows you is that um, if you lose whatever the number is down here on the bottom, the percentage on top is the amount you need to make to get back to even. So if you lose 50% here, right there, you need 100% gain to get back to even. But if you lose 90%, let's go back to Bitcoin, if you lose 90% of your money, in order for this to get back to even, you need to make 900%. So let's not get too excited here about Bitcoin. There's actually been some rumors that, um, I, can't, I can't confirm this news, but I've heard that um, there's some rumors that things are going to stop trading. Uh, Bitcoin's gonna stop trading on some exchanges and that there's some short positions out there that some people were looking to cover um, to get out of the way before it stopped trading and they couldn't get out. So. Um, there's, some people are saying that that's what's caused this kind of bump recently, but I wouldn't be touching this thing still. Yes, it's got positive momentum. Yes, it's had some positive momentum divergence. Yes, it's above its 200-day uh, moving average, albeit very, very small. We had one bump here. Um, I just, I just wouldn't be touching it. That's just me, in my opinion. Well, let's talk about some things that I do like, though. So. First of all, I like oil. Um, this was uh, oil at year end. This is a chart that I showed on our market outlook screencast in January. Uh, I pointed out that we saw lower prices here. So market the oil market still going down pretty dramatically, but we saw some positive momentum divergence down here in the momentum indicator. Now let's take a look at how oil's done since then. Here's the positive momentum. Here's the lower prices. We've seen momentum continue to head higher. Most recently a breakout in momentum above 70 and we've seen prices head higher above the 200 day moving average so this is all good i like oil um full disclosure we own oil uh in our clients portfolios so um uh, this is something that i do like um of course i don't think you should buy any investment without an exit strategy and we have one so um something that uh, another another position i do like is gold this was at the end of the year um i you know i've been looking at this top in 2014 Here's one in 2016, here's one in 2018, and then we kind of keep seeing these higher lows. So here's a low, higher low, higher low. <clears throat> and the more these we've seen these higher lows, the more and the more times we touch this line here, um, the more solid this gets. So it's gonna be hard for gold, I think, to break out above this 1370 level, but here's gold today. It's continued up, pulled back, Again, full disclosure, we own gold in our clients' portfolios. Not because I think that um, you know the U.S. dollar is collapsing. Not because I think the U.S. economy is going to collapse. Um, it definitely would be a hedge. Um, but the U.S. dollar um, has been uh, looking a little iffy lately. If the dollar goes down, then we could see positive movement in gold. Um, I do think that gold is also a good hedge. Um, <clears throat> when the market is getting a little choppy, which it obviously has been. Um, again, I want to reiterate, this has not been a healthy bull market this last 12 months. So... Um, right now we own gold, but with a very, very tight stop and a tight, tight exit strategy. Let's talk about a few other of my favorite things here. Um, I stole that phrase from my good friend, uh, David Cox and at CIBC Wood Gundy in Canada, Guelph, Canada, um, uh, Guelph, Ontario, I should say. But, um, one of the things I really like is, uh, software and services stocks. So this is an ETF that has, a, it's a basket of software and services stocks. If you remember, if you go back to the U S stock market, I'll pan back there really briefly here. Um, so here's U.S. stocks coming down, up, back above the October, November, December, March highs, back above the January highs, but not quite up above their all-time highs. And this is the same thing as the uh, same time frame, I should say, as the software and services sector ETF. So um, here we've got not only have we crossed above the October, November, uh, December highs, but we're at the all-time highs already. So we've already broken out and we see nice, convincing, decisive, positive momentum. Similarly speaking, same thing in semiconductors. Um, semiconductor stocks <clears throat> never even got below 70 um, on momentum down here. So even when they went down, bounced, and headed lower, still no negative momentum below 30. But as they bounced, we see positive momentum. It's gotten a, not only above, again, the October, December uh, highs, but it's broken out above the all-time highs, and it's headed even higher. So just to kind of close out, I've um, been sick this past couple weeks and I'm starting to lose my voice, so I um, probably shouldn't have made this go as long as I did anyway, but um, what should we do now or what, what's the market, the longer term market outlook now? And I'll pull up the same thing that I did last time in uh, January. You know, back in 1998, we had a head fake. You know, we, 
we had a, a market that looked like it was going to crash and it didn't. So the market cried wolf and the market did not crash or the wolf did not come. <clears throat> then we saw the same kind of thing happen in 2000 and it crashed, 47% loss. Then here in 2008, we have this 58% loss. Then we get a head fake in 2012, head fake between 2015 and 16. And then we have this kind of choppy sideways market um, in 2018 going into 2019. So <clears throat> same chart as before, um, same message here. This is very long term. Um, the bottom line is, is we've got to get out of this mess, um, whether that works its way sideways. And we got to head to all time highs. We've got to head above those all time highs before we can uh, see any real good, healthy, uh, positive movement in the bull market. But um, in closing, I just want everyone, again, to remember to focus on the things you can control. You cannot control how much um, what the market does. You cannot control who the president is. You cannot control um, whether or not you get help from stocks or if stocks hurt you. But you can control how much you save, how much you spend, and you can have a financial plan. And you can stick to that plan. You can monitor it over time and make sure that uh, you know that your plan is in a good place for the amount of money you have, the amount of money you're spending. Um, and when you're retiring, if you haven't retired yet, or if you're already retired, the minimum rate of return that you need to earn to make sure you never, ever run out of money. So um, financial plans are crucial. Cerulean Associates did a study um, years ago, found that only 81% of financial planning firms actually do financial plans. So um, if you want a second opinion, if you want a financial plan, please give our office a call. Let us know. But um, I'm going to close this out at about 30 minutes. And um, if you have any questions, please, by all means, call me personally at the office. Uh, email us. You can follow me on Twitter at Adam Koch. Um, you can follow our firm on Twitter at LibertasWM, of course, Facebook, um, although we're not as active there as we are in the other uh, places. But again, if you, if you want to reach out, if you have any questions, if you want a second opinion, uh, uh, second opinion on your portfolio, um, your investment portfolio, or your financial plan, or if you don't have a plan and you'd like one, um, please give us a ring and uh, ask to set up an introductory appointment. Um, these meetings are no cost, and um, we would love to, to hear from you. Um, whether you're a client or not, I always like to say you don't have to be a client to ask a question. So, all right, well, I'll sign up for now and April 10th, 2019, beginning of the second quarter, and we'll hope to see you at our next quarter screencast.